start it whenever you want. <coughs> Perfect. So hello again uh, to everyone returning for this, our fourth session for uh, MMU Gothic Approaches. And to everyone joining for the first time, welcome to Gothic Cultures. Uh, I am Oliver Rendell. I'm here to reintroduce the series before passing you on to Fred, who is tonight's session. As usual, if I could ask everyone to keep their mics and cameras switched off, as you are now, uh, for the duration of the papers and to throw all of your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, but by all means, let us know where you're joining from, how you found out about MMU Gothic, um, what events you've been to in the past, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, as you can see on your screens now, we're going to be recording the event uh, to make it available on the Centre for Gothic Studies new YouTube channel. And if you've missed our other sessions, they are slowly ma making their way on there now. Once again, I'd like to thank Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies for enabling this webinar series and for promoting it. For those that don't know, since 2013, uh, the centre has been offering postgraduate studies at MA and PhD levels. Anyone keen to get more involved with the centre, the Modern and Contemporary Gothic Reading Group is coming together now and will begin on the 1st of June, I believe, Fred? Uh, with Carmen Maria Machado's collection, Her Body and Other Parties. Okay. Manchester University Press is supporting the seminar series and have provided us with a 30% discount code, which you can find in the event chat. I believe, Teresa, you can put that in now. Uh, and we'll add it again once more uh, at the end of the event, just in case it gets buried by questions and stuff. Gothic Approaches itself is organised by current PhD researchers, uh, myself, uh, Teresa Fitzpatrick, Kate Maloney, Frederick Blank, and Alicia Christina Edwards. Uh, with it, we aim to showcase the diversity in Gothic research now underway at the uh, Manchester Metropolitan University. And each session will offer two papers on a complementary theme that the speakers will address for 20 minutes each. The next session, uh, next month, will be on Eco Gothic. And the page, uh, the, the event by page is uh, currently live. Questions will be taken at the end uh, and picked up along the way by our moderator, which is Teresa tonight. Or if you're more comfortable switching on your camera, you're welcome to come on and ask, your, ask a question yourself. Uh, please do put your question in the chat as well, though, just so we have a, a record of them uh, afterwards. Tonight's session is titled Gothic Occultures. Our speakers will be discussing how the Gothic appears in contemporary culture uh, through orality and sound uh, through two fascinating and I suspect very different papers. So I'll hand you over to Fred to introduce them. Thank you, Ollie. And hello, everyone. Um, my name is Fred Blanc, as I mentioned. Uh, our first speaker will be today uh, Jose Sherwood Gonzalez with his paper Tesca. And I messed it up, I knew it was going to be Te uh, Tesca Tlipoca. Uh, Astrid Kierkegaard's Unveiled Visuality in Mexican Family Myths. Um, <clears throat> Jose Sherwood Gonzalez is a British Mexican comics artist, comic artist and visual anthropologist with research interest in memory, storytelling, and multi-perspectival uh, myth-making through visual, sensory, and digital methods. Recent graduate uh, from the MA in Visual Anthropology and the Granada Center for Visual Anthropology. Jose is currently pro pro uh, pursuing a practice-based PhD in the School of Digital Arts, SODA, at Manchester Metropolitan University, on Mesoamerican futurisms and asar based speculative fictions. He is visual and sound editor for Otherwise Magazine, and makes comics and ethnographics inspired by the plurality of experience from migrant workers on gate platforms to Mexican family storytelling. Um, with that, uh, Jose, if you want to take it away. Thank I'll you. Myself. Thank you, Frederick, so much. And I'm, I'm on Mateo's computer, which is why I probably I'm called Matteo here, and, I'm, and Matteo's here with me. Um, so um, could you share the slide oh, on here? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure if sharing yeah, just yeah, yet. Sure. So I'll just get started whilst we're just working this out. And then, but yeah, so I'm going to be talking about Tezcatlipoca, the Lord of the Smoking Mirror, and um, Aztec Tricks to Gods and Veiled Visuality in Mexican Family Myths. Uh, I'm doing a practice-based PhD, as, as Fred mentioned, and I'm looking into extended reality and shamanism. And I'm not really going to talk about that today because it's really fresh. I only just started in October of last year. So uh, 
I, I'm, I thought what I would do instead is, is give you a bit of a, a presentation as to the reasons why and how I got to this point. And so this is a journey that starts in, uh, in my undergraduate in 2014. And it's where also my, my MA in visual anthropology ended up being, which is just up the road. And so I'm going to be tracing lines from oral storytelling traditions in Mexican families, um, such as my own family, as well as pre-Hispanic codices, colonial ex-votive paintings, satirical 19th century wood etchings, and 20th century superheroes in comics, uh, especially luchadores, the Mexican wrestlers. And this whole project is called the story of mirrors and mirrors are an important theme throughout my, my practice, my kind of transdisciplinary practice uh, where I mostly use comics, but I'm also a filmmaker. And so the optics of, uh, of reflexivity and of diffraction are really important. Um, and this is where Tezcatlipoca comes into, into action. Um, I use Tezcatlipoca, I apply Tezcatlipoca as a conceptual lens through which to decipher how contemporary Mexicans uh, perceive the notion of uncertainty, uh, specifically the uncertainty of life and of death. But, and of ancestral memory. And I'm going to go more into who Tezcatlipoca is. But I just thought I would um, say that, you know, this is kind of uh, a way in which I make use or make sense of the ambiguity that I encountered when I started recording my family stories in 2014. So in the summer of 2014, I went to Mexico City and I recorded 12 of my family members telling a story about my great-grandfather, Chucho. There were storytellers that ranged from uh, my great aunt and my, and my uh, grandfather, who were born in the 1930s to the 1960s. With, in my, and so this was like my mother's generation, the people that grew up with the Beatles and, um, and so my aunts and uncles. And I, um, I ended up finding, about the story, finding out first about this story in 2014 and so this is actually the first comic i ever made and it's it's quite hard for me, for me to look at now but this is uh, you know we were returning home after watching 12 years a slave in clandudno and um my my mum like told me that, she, that the the cotton pickers in that movie had um kind of reminded her of a photograph that she had once seen of her great grandparents. This is like in the 1920s, so during the Great Depression. And I was just like, what? Like, I'd never heard this story before. You know, I'm, I grew up in North Wales. We were in Clandudno and, you know, we went to Mexico very often and I knew who, who Chucho was, but it wasn't the case that I'd heard anything about this. And like from this process, I ended up um, kind of finding out about all these stories about my my great grandfather. How was this like very heroic perspective of who he was? Uh, you can see he's the one that's in um, the wheelchair at the top. That was kind of towards the end of his life. And you also have some of the pictures there of when he was in the cinema industry, and where he's dressed up as a Japanese ambassador. And so these are a collection of some of the photographs that I found is because after I found after that car journey, I got obsessed. I was like, I need to record everything that I can find about this, this man. And my mum had like this, this black purse. And within this black purse, uh, I, I found all kinds of different, uh, different um, photos. And so I collected all these photographs and then I, I, um, I took it to uh, with me to Mexico, kind of scans of these. And um, and so then I decided that what I was going to do is I was going to interview everyone. I was going to make a film about it and it was going to be the next masterpiece that, you know, was uh, going to hit can or something. I don't even know what. And so I don't think this is going to share any audio, but I just wanted to give you like a little example of what the um, of what of, of what the um, of what the film consisted of, because I was I what I, I did was that I asked everyone to tell the story as they remembered it. And so some of the people in the, in the, you know, this is intergenerational storytelling is very, you know, classical people would sit, um, Chucho would sit with everyone around him and they, and he would um, tell the story. And so I was trying to replicate this using cameras and, uh, and microphones to record this sense of that, you know, we would spend hours, I think I got like 28 hours of footage in the end. And I was inspired by Sarah Polly and the film stories we tell and 
I, I won't get into this too much because there's other things that I'm going to cover, but um, it's just there's a quote here where Hilary Mantel writes, as soon as we die, we enter into fiction. Just ask two different family members to tell you about someone recently gone and you will see what I mean. So we know this in English as um, as Chinese whispers, which is probably quite a problematic way of talking about it. In other languages, it's called telephone. So broken telephone, teléfono descompuesto in Spanish. And this kind of way in which the um, the utterance of the story is told and then deformed uh, as other people share the story is something that is interesting to me. Like, I think that that's the thing where um, this phenomena can also be tracked into what analog and digital recording can do. And maybe this is the link with, with mine and Mateo, Mateo's work. We could explore this later on. But these kind of disruptions were very interesting to me. The kind of looking for the differences in stories and and yeah, this is also known as the Rashomon effect in, in films. There's an Akira Kurosawa movie where uh, everyone was exploring their own version of this. Um, there was different explorations of, of the versions of the truth. And it's up to you as the as the audience to decide and, and decipher what's going on and how you feel about all the different uh, narratives that are coming at you. And so this kind of multiplicity of perspectives was very interesting to me. So I wanted to make this choral film the problem is, is that that's not exactly how it worked out. So after a couple of years, I made this short film. It was in 2017. I, I shared it with my family and it touched the nerve with the older generation. So these are the people that were closest to the family. They uh, had uh, felt like they knew what the story was, but it and, and this was specifically, it was to do with um, the, this idea of of mistreatment going on in the family. So there were like lots of stories that I just didn't expect to find out that were uncovered during this process. And so it, it also became a process of working out on my behalf what stories to tell and what stories we shouldn't tell, especially because in Mexico people share, you know, very happy to share these stories. But my position is coming into this space and uh, recording the stories and taking it into a different arena um, worried them. I think my, my great aunt was worried that she was going to um, that I was going to make a, a, a really big film and everyone was going to see it. But clearly, um, I mean, that wasn't the case. Um, and she, yeah, she said that she was going to put my uncles in jail. And I kind of believed her because she is a retired judge um, and she's a very impressive woman. And so uh, it was a, it, it kind of I just left me with a lot of uncertainty and I didn't know what to do. I had all this material recorded and but I could no longer make a film. It was quite clear that I couldn't make a film, right? And so I ended up um, stopping the project for a while uh, and just, you know, didn't know what to do with it. But then I ended up um, starting this master's in visual anthropology um, just up the road in the University of Manchester. And I was able to explore lots of different methods. Some of them was sound, but I found out about comics. So comics are a, the way I see comics that they're a, they are a radically empirical tool for ethnographic fieldwork specifically. But this is what Nick Susanis uh, in Unflattening calls a simultaneous engagement of multiple vantage points from which to engender new ways of seeing. And in this sense, comics can rupture time and space through the interplay of image and text to create a shared visual language that works in the interstitial space between author and audience. And I found that comics were a way in which I could start to access uh, this this story again. That you know it was I was able to open up uh, from a creative block and from a block in life to them. Um, really a lot of these stories started to emerge uh you know i haven't gone into it fully but you know i have like scrivener pages and you know notes i had a whole script that i was using to make this documentary i edited the documentary but couldn't use it and so i was ready to tell the story and it started to emerge and and the the, the funny thing is is that the, the 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 kind of aha moment when it came to drawing comics 
um, about my family was um, was through an ink stain. Like I felt like it fell on the page, and then I I realized that I I I could anonymize my family members, and this you know uh, allowed me to to um, to kind of develop a recurring theme by turning my family into skulls, skeletons, Katrinas, who were these kind of very posh 19th century women. And it was, um, it was, a, it was a liberating process for me. And it, I hope that what it also allows, um, what well, my intentions were that this was, would allow you to enter deeper into the mythic elements of the story. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, so I also, yeah, as I said, I found that uh, the use of masks also helped in further anonymizing my, the participants, the family members who were telling the stories that didn't want to be involved. Um, so these kind of images built towards what I understood as a Mexican visuality. And so these, uh, by incorporating these images of masks, of death, and of vision as, as a visual motif, um, it kind of allowed myth to become a motif in itself that where that I could I could uh, process through image making, and so this is where partial elements such as objects and pictures. Um, I'm trying to see if there are any in here, but there are certain elements that I embedded into here, so into the comic page, such as um, volcanoes for people uh, here. And the, the reason why I, I, I point this out is because my grandfather's artwork was a massive influence in what I did. So my granddad is um, an artist. He's been painting since the 1950s. And this, um, the, he uses um, volcanoes, he, he has um, skeletons in the Catrinas. And so this is whole kind of visual kind of uh, swamp from which to work from that I was I was I was using the, these images and it helped me to tell this story and it allowed me to evoke these these ongoing human biographies and these sensory biographies that were emerging and I mean I guess quite simply I mean it's the, the day of the dead kind of images right but it goes a lot deeper than this and the way that I like to understand this is 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 through uh, Robert Carlyle's definition of visuality and it doesn't necessarily pertain to vision as such, but it's vision in the sense of the capacity to register sensory impressions through the eye. Um, so it's not that, it's rather an imaginary that is not the image of something else, but without which there cannot be something else. And visuality in this sense is the unstable element of visual experience that is contingent on culture and is resistant to description. And it can be summarized with the following question. How did people in past or alien cultures perceive the objects we now study and what experiences and ideas grounded their viewing and what in the end did they see? So with regards to my family stories, visuality provides a way in which I could start to understand these intangible aspects of knowledge that were resistant to being visualized or were resistant to being expressed in film. And so comics became a really productive tool for me to be able to do this. Some of, this is some more of my granddad's artwork. And so I felt like it, um, his artwork was kind of constantly in dialogue with this distinctly like versatile visual language uh, regarding life and death and Mexican tradition and and yeah the broadly engages with this Mexican visuality in some way and so when I asked my granddad he would never tell me why he was interested in it like or what what you know I, I would ask him like so what is this all about what do your your your, your you know what what does this mean you know why why is there suns and their moons and he would never tell me the answer uh, and, and he never told me what they meant and and I kind of would ask him this kind of ad nauseum until he, uh, in 2014, he kind of came downstairs with a book, which was Paul Westheim's La Calavera, The Skeleton. And in this book, Westheim argues that Tezcatlipoca is a way in which you can understand how contemporary Mexicans perceive art, life and death. And it's this way of passing down distinctly Mexican perspectives surrounding the uncertainty of life and death 
and ancestral memory. And so Tezcalipoca is the Aztec god of the night sky, and he's represented by the Ursa Mayor, the uh, great bear constellation, uh, which the Aztec saw as a jaguar. And the jaguar was Tezcalipoca's Nahual, his animal disguise. And he's associated with the uncertainty of life, ancestral memory, but also a presence of an absence, a shaman-like shadow that crosses spatial and mythical boundaries with impunity. Tezcalipoca is the enigmatic Aztec trickster god, and the name means smoking mirror, and is thus characterized by an obsidian mirror. For a, and this is like black uh, volcanic glass for a leg. And if we're to believe ethno-historical sources, the black mirror uh, gave its owner perceptual access to the intangible world of reflections, where souls, spirits, and the imminent forces of the cosmos dwell. And this would mean even seeing uh, the ref one's reflection in the water or see watching smoke rise from Popocatépetl, the volcanoes in around the Mexican, the basin of Mexico, near Mexico City, or even hearing echoes could all be sign of Tezcatlipoca in the world. And the jaguar counterpart is important here because you've got Tepe Yolotl, who's the heart of the mountain. He's the, and so he's the god of mountains and earthquakes and echoes. And when my, uh, so my aunt, uh, when, when we made up and we uh, said sorry to everyone about what happened and we apologized, she said, um, I, I apologize that um, you had to go through two earthquakes because this was in 2017 and we went through two actual earthquakes in November. Uh, I almost thought at one moment that I was going to die in Crocs, which is a bad, bad idea. And so, um, but then she said, I apologize because there's, um, you know, for, for, for you having to go through three earthquakes, which is this phone call. And so there's these resonances, I think, um, with, with what was going on there. And yeah, I... Um, I've got a translation here that I was, I'm, I'm just trying to think whether I should I should say it or not, but it's Tezcalipoca. It's about the, the it's the conviction of man that you are not the de the the owner of your destiny. The uncertainty about tomorrow is going to keep on going for every day, and this concept is embedded into Tezcalipoca. And so for both the Maya and the Mexica, and the, really for everyone inhabiting Mesoamerica before the Spaniards arrived, the very word mirror was synonymous with the concept of ruler. And the mirror pierced on th through both sides uh, and it had two faces and hence it had two functions. To reveal, one was to reveal Tezcatlipoca's will to the people and also to reveal to the person the misdoings, their misdoings. So very much a receiver and a communicator of divine force and it's really similar to what you know a human eye can do right there's this visuality that comes back into it it would reveal fates and there was also this thing where you could make the mirror shine right it was about um the smoke would emerge from the mirror and through this you would be able to perceive what was going on and it's used uh, the mirror is still used today as a, as a form of divination it's called scrying, and uh, this is actually John Mee's, uh, John D's mirror, which uh, is kept in the British Museum alongside the um, a skeleton of Tezcatlipoca, a um, an effigy, a bundle that was meant to be worn on the back. I think I have an image coming up. So, just to kind of fi finish up, I'll just show a couple of these images as to as to where um, this kind of Mexican visuality occurs and where I think Tezcatlipoca um, is experienced in 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 Mexican visual culture. So here you've got the ex votos, they're called retablos, ex votive paintings, and they're typically painted on tin and they are a way in which people can say thank you. Um, having survived something, it's a, having experienced a miracle. You then go and you either paint this yourself or you uh, paint, uh, you ask someone to paint it for you. I particularly love the one with the UFO in the corner. And the, yeah, the Day of the Dead um, kind of embodies this, uh, in the, these calaveritas, which can be either poems or they can be candy skulls, are crucial. But then you also have 
the uh, Catrinas from Jose Guadalupe Posada, who used these as a, as a way in which you could have um, satirical um, comics, really, and they were used as propaganda for the revolution, as well as Diego Rivera's painting. Um, you've got Frida Kahlo right next to a Catrina with the, uh, with the skeleton there. And yeah, again, the volcanoes, but I'm wary of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and just kind of say that this has kind of informed a little bit of, um, of what my work is today in the sense that I'm, I'm putting these ideas together and helping them to inform some kind of media theory of, uh, from shamanic rituals to spatial computing. And so there's some concepts that I want to explore, which I've touched upon today, which is um, the optics of the mirror. And so whether mirrors reflect um, who we are or whether they diffract who we are and they create the potential for imagination. So this is gonna inform some kind of speculative fiction or design fiction about the role of extended reality uh, technologies and how we've been transforming with technology uh, as we go along. But I'll, I'll leave it there and pass it over to Matteo. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, well, we're very excited to hear more of it uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, and indeed, our second speaker on the same screen uh, is uh, Matteo Podato uh, with his uh, presentation uh, with his new um, term, We Act as Detectors, Decoders, and Amplifiers, the Role of Resonance-Based Processes in Discourses on Paranormal Experiences. Um, Matteo Polato is a researcher, curator, and sound artist. He's currently a PhD candidate here, again, at Manchester Metropolitan University, researching on the roles of sound, vibration, and resonance-based processes in discourses about supernatural experiences. His background is in media studies, sound studies, and sonic arts. His artistic practice spans from electroacoustic composition to free improvisation and psychedelic rock. Uh, thank you, Matteo. Uh, take thank it you. away. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me, inviting us. Oh, so I'm going to share. I'm going to try my best to say in time. Can you give me like that? Yeah, thank you. Sorry. All right. <clears throat> so yeah, um, today I'm gonna talk a bit about my research, my ongoing res PhD research here at the School of Digital Art at MMU. Um, as Fred has introduced, my research is about the development of a novel methodological and theoretical approach to analyze discourse on paranormal experiences in specifically in contemporary Western culture. And to do so, what I'm developing is a, a ontopistemological tool, which is the concept of resonance, which is uh, what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to do this research. I'm doing this research through the analysis of three main case studies. I'm going to talk about them at the end. Um, so in this field, terminology and definition can be very slippery, very tricky. So I'm working on and my definition of the paranormal and why I use the term paranormal instead of other terms such as uh, supernatural, supernormal, otherworldly, etc. So my definition is very broad and it's the wide spectrum of liminal and peripheral experiences that force a subject to negotiate and renegotiate the established consensual boundaries of everyday reality, eventually assuming the potentiality of an otherworldly agency at work. So um, my approach to the paranormal and my approach to the paranormal experience in particular is that not to um, consider the paranormal as a fixed object of investigation to be analyzed, for example, for its like, ontological impossibility, uh, but rather as a process, a process that establishes strong connections with everyday, the everyday life of the world, with perception, with imagination, and kind of a process which uh, is a movement, an uh, oscillation between the natural, the everyday world and the supernatural. And my research is not really about the 
paranormal experiences themselves, but rather than the process that brings forward to the experience and what after, after um, what happens after the experience. So my main research questions are. Yeah, how is a place, a situation or an event charged with the potentiality of the presence of the paranormal? And after this, what processes actualize and capture such potential leading to the paranormal imagination to the to charge yeah, the place or the situation to with paranormal meaning? And after the experience, what changes uh, in the place? So how do we live? How do we interact or inhabit? a place that is deemed to be haunted, for example, and how do we make sense of, or do we share, or communicate, or circulate this kind of experience, like collectively? So, as I said, as I mentioned, the main tool I'm uh, developing to uh, take this research is the one of resonance. The resonance, which is strictly connected, of course, to sound and to vibration. Uh, resonance is a fundamental concept in physics, but it is widely used also outside the hard sciences and also like in philosophy. I particularly like this definition by Mulhoff, which is the resonance is a type of relational dynamics of affecting and being affected, characterized as a process of reciprocal modulation between interactants. Resonance is a relational and processual phenomenon. It arises through a complex interplay between the affective disposition of multiple individuals and contextual factors within an affective arrangement. So I'm interested in the relationalities, the interaction, the recursive feedbacks that are embedded in, in the concept of resonance. And my use of resonance in my analysis is at the same time by looking at how actual physical resonances in the form of sonic and vibratory uh, phenomena are involved in paranormal experiences, um, alleged paranormal experiences, and also from a discursive, more symbolic point of view, how resonance is employed to make sense of this kind of experience, how to build like also narratives out of the experience and uh, hypotheses and theories. So, for example, from um, more specifically, the material affective part of resonance, uh, sound and vibration are fundamental uh, dimension in particular in what precedes and prepare for the experience of the supernatural or the paranormal. For example, the common trope of the haunted house, the first phenomena that arise also in fiction are like footsteps or noises. And those are kind of like the trigger of the paranormal imagination and this process then goes forward till the apparition. And also like more generally affective or bodily or physical dimension of the experience. So senses of shivers, of breezes, of sense of touch. They are connected to this kind of relational dimension that resonance uh, explains. And my use, I use resonance in particular instead of a sound uh, or vibration because I don't conceive sound as an object, but rather as an event and again as a relational interactional event and as a medium of interaction with the environment. So I'm interested in paranormal experiences in particular uh, about the role of acoustics, sound in space, ecologies of listening, our relationship rela relations and interactions again are established and how this kind of interaction and um are can bring the idea the con the the sensation of the supernatural on the other hand for the more discursive part um the vast majority i would say of the attempts as at uh, explaining or building hypotheses but also to debunk or to explain away the paranormal in the last i will say like 200 years at least vast majority of these like discourses somehow employ some kind of resonance based terminology. So the idea of harmony of attunement, uh, sympathy, rapport, uh, or in particular, even more use the use of uh, resonance based technologies as metaphors. So in particular radio, so the tuning in to be in the right wavelength, to be a receiver or a sender. Um, as if the process of the paranormal experience is best 
uh, explained as resonance-like, even if, that, if it doesn't involve actual physical vibration of sounds, it behaves as if it was a resonance-based uh, resonance phenomenon. And in fact, through the last two centuries, you can find uh, very easy to find, like, uh, yeah, um, hypotheses or theories that they're built upon the period mm, majority, major or more important uh, scientific scientific uh, discoveries. So, for example, the problem is explained in terms of magnetism, electricity, radioactivity, radio waves, creative international force, geomagnetism, infrasound, ultrasound, recently quantum entanglement, and the list goes on. So here I have two examples, but I want to be a bit quick. For example, yeah, the idea of John Keel is a famous um, paranormal investigator and psychical researcher um, who po popularized the the entity, the, 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 the lore of Mothman, for example, and he built this idea of this super spectrum. So for him, all paranormal entities are not supernatural. They are natural, they are physical, but they live, they inhabit different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, which are inaccessible to us. So for this reason, we can't detect them. Sometimes they can um, cross the electromagnetic spectrum and when they cross through for example the spectrum of visible light they, they become visible and so people see ufos like briefly or see bigfoot or see ghosts the same applies for sound of course and when they reach the the the, 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 the frequency of the audible uh the audible frequencies so <clears throat> Um, my main argument is that by tracing the roles and relationships between multiple modes of resonance involved in paranormal discourses, it is possible to highlight the processuality implicit in such experiences, paranormal experiences, and to understand how they establish a complex articulations with the everyday, with place, with affective sensation, and with imagination. So, the first of my the case studies that I'm analyzing is the film, the Stone Tape. You probably know it as um, from the 72 BBC program as part of the traditional ghost stories for Christmas uh, written by Nigel Neal. Might be strange to use a fictional work for um, uh, research on paranormal experiences, but I treat the film as a work of theory fiction. So through the, the, the fictional medium, the film actually explains and theorizes upon something which is which can be traced back to the whole history of psychical research. Um, the film popularized this idea of the stone tape theory, which is the idea that hauntings are not and ghosts are not spirits of the dead, but rather they are recordings of past tragic. Um, emotional and psychological events that got stored and recorded um, and imprinted into the molecular composition, molecular uh, structure of matter itself. And after some time, some sensitive people can actually act as magnetic heads of a magnetic tape recorder and to pick the recording and to see the scene again, uh, to hear it. To hear it. So I, I think of the Stone Tape as a work of theory fiction because um, by following the characters developing this theory within the film, it is actually possible to retrace the whole history of this concept, which is one of the most important and influential concepts in psychical research regarding to hauntings that got different names such as like psychometry or residual haunting, place memory, psychic ether, and so on. And it's a theory that is founded on sound and resonance. So according to, um, regarding to, to the material resonances uh, represented in the stone tape, the film is, uh, has a fundamental role of 
echo and reverberation and room resonance and architectural acoustics. And actually the haunting emerges from reverb. It is made of resonances. Um, this is a part of the script where basically the, the, the characters are inside this haunted room and there this is the first apparition and two men uh, walk away and there the echo of their footsteps get like bounces back into the room and from this same echo the echo of the ghostly footsteps emerge so this one really one thing that gets from them from uh, the materiality of like natural reality to a supernatural one and uh, so um, from my point of view, if uh, the stone tape is analyzed from a visual perspective, the haunting emerges as a kind of like ontological rupture, fundamental rupture and cut from like natural, ordinary reality. However, if uh, the analysis is conducted from an um, acoustic point of view, this um, fundamental cut disappears and the haunting becomes um, the culminating point of a seamless process that starts from the ordinary world of humans and gets to the uh, a supernatural world. And this is um, achieved in the film with a careful, a very complex uh, dramaturgy of different reverberations and different uh, acoustic characters of the different rooms that are portrayed in the film. And I analyze uh, uh, some of the and soundtracks for each room. And so basically, before the first apparition, we start from the driest place, the driest acoustically place of the, of the film, which is the laboratory, through a corridor, which is more reverberant, through the haunted room, which is the most reverberant place, the most echoing place in the film. And so from one hand, this is the place that allows for a resonance based haunting to emerge and on the other hand this progression there was more and more agency of sound itself and of resonance itself um, expresses i would say like a progressive deterritorialization from our human uh, ordered uh, territory to a place which is uh, defined by non-human agency material agencies that are expressed through the reverb itself and from which also like non-natural agencies emerge, such as the ghost. Um, I kind of forgot to talk what the film is about. <laughs> um, basically, it, uh, uh, the story tells about um, this group of scientists, They're the research development team of this technology company. They, they go to the new headquarters and they realize that one of the rooms is actually haunted. As scientists, when they um, acknowledge the reality of the haunting, they start studying it as in this image with um, technology, with the tools, with like um, scientific instruments to try to understand the nature of the of the haunting and to try to exploit its properties to try to be able to control it to make it a new recording medium and through this process in the film we actually uh, as i said we retrace the history of this concept in psychical research and this is like the breakthrough of the theory within the film when the lead uh, the leader of the group says that it must work like a recording. And we act as detectors, the coders, amplifiers. So the process is understood as resonant like. And the metaphor used is well, that of radio. So human body becomes a radio receiver. And there's this some kind of uh, vibratory energy at work in the room. And we act as detectors, the coders, and amplifiers, which are the fundamental building blocks of radio reception. The human body becomes an antenna. The second um, case study that I'm analyzing is the so-called Philip experiment. is an experiment conducted in the early 70s in the, by the Toronto Society for Psychical Research, and it's documented by a book. Uh, this is the um, this is the cover, a book, some articles and uh, some television programs got um, 
quite a major coverage those years. The idea of the group was um, to understand that whether ghosts are spirits of the dead or rather physical manifestation of telepathic energy, which was a very common hypothesis in the 70s in psychical research. And they used traditional Victorian science in a still scientific environment and with the aim to conjure not a spirit but a fictional ghost. So they make up a story of this English nobleman lived in the 1600s, uh, a story which is clearly fic fictional and which has also some historical um, errors to be sure that it couldn't be an actual person and to try to see whether they could be able to obtain a communication with this uh, fictional ghost through the traditional practice of the seance. Um, of course, they, um, the alleged um, physical phenomena they obtained are all about sounds and vibrations, sounds in the form of the, of the uh, traditional raps and knocks on the table, and vibration and vibratory interactions. In, they talk in particular about how the table was vibrating, it was kind of connecting all the groups, was uh, all the people, hands were like, uh, in circle and um, touching the table, and were connecting, interacting with all other members of the group with um, through this vibration of the table. And from this affective and material dimension of the performance of the seance, we get to uh, a form of communication, uh, pretty, yeah, and again, a pretty traditional one, so kind of like, uh, you know, telegraphic-like communication, whether they, uh, the ghost will answer with one knock for yes, two knocks for no. This connect to the discursive resonance part of the of the case study. So they constantly talk about how they are able to obtain these um, this phenomena because of a perfect harmony between them, and uh, there they talk about these different kind of. I, I call them resonance frequencies to be attuned to in order to charge the group, to charge the, uh, the telepathic energy of the group and achieve this physical phenomena. And there's different frequency, different um, articulation in time of cycles. Uh, so the mutual rapport between the participant or the cycles of the weekly session, they have to be conducted in a certain way. Within the section, there must be a correct cycles of tension and relaxation. Uh, to build up the energy of the group. Uh, they were using singing and rhythm uh, to uh, articulate the, the, the session and then the table would tilt, it would tilt at a specific rate, a specific frequency, a specific uh, speed and then they get the vibration and the auditory vibration in the form of raps and knocks. So, so is, it is as if all these are different resonant frequencies that the group has to, uh, to attune to exactly to uh, to uh, to reach this kind of um, um, this kind of like attunement and, and energy to reach to 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 arrive to the to the physical phenomena. Yeah, um, I think my time is it's over 20 minutes. I have one last case study, but yeah, I don't think it's fine. I don't know what you think. Yeah, it's fine. You, I, I, you have another three, four minutes. Okay. So be fine. Last case study I'm analyzing is very recent. It's called The Hellier is a, a documentary series starting in 2019 and ongoing. It is representative of kind of a new wave of paranormal discourse, paranormal investigation. The, story, the documentary, documentary follows the, um, this investigation made by these four uh, American people on this uh, alleged case of strange creatures and disturbances in rural Kentucky, in uh, miners' towns in Kentucky. 
Um, the series gained a vast popularity online, in online community, and this is a very important part of the series because there's a constant real-time conversation between the investigators and their community online that actually uh, extend the investigation, they, build, they, they, they give ideas and hints and theories. And so this 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 kind of yeah again resonance between the real world between the the, the investigation and and field work and the online community through this kind of a shared knowledge and uh, um again this um most of what the story the, the, the documentary is about is the, uh, this people investigating in caves uh, in woods and in the in these little towns and they're not that much about um the search of physical proof of the sort of paranormal but rather uh, the delving the sensation the feeling the effective uh, dimension of the investigation itself and how sound and vibration brings this kind of um this kind of dimension and uh, from uh, the discursive point of view the, their methodology is based on synchronicities and uh, the uh, kind of affective discursive attunement to chance this coincidence that that happens at random events and their idea they constantly talk about the fact that the more synchronicities happen in the place the more they're on the right path for their investigation they're about to achieve to something and uh, so the synchronicities in my case in, in my view establish a kind of relationship between the physical phenomena experiences and uh, the, 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 the physical part of the investigation and the collective paranormal narratives of the place because all the synchronicities are about kind of reenactment reperformance of uh, the stories of the place and the, and, and the lore behind the investigation they're conducting all right so this is just uh okay thank you thank you very much uh, Matteo. that was a, also another brilliant um presentation uh i'll just ask well since you're sharing the same screen but i'll ask jose to come now for uh to join us for uh the q a uh part of this uh wonderful um event that we have tonight this is a wonderful talk um, so do remember if you have a questions uh, in, in the audience, any participants, if you want to ask questions, you can put them in the chat uh, and or um, and raise uh, your hand in the chat to to, uh, to ask a question. You can come also to ask a question directly. Am I still sharing the screen? No. Okay. Yes, you still are sharing the screen. You can see my face. There we go. Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, so. I, I do have a few questions, but I'm sure that we will have a few questions uh, very soon in the chat. Uh, very fascinating papers, both of you. Uh, I was, when it comes to, to, to the first one for you, Jose, I, I mean, I, I find the, the idea of, of the skulls, the, just sort of a, the sense of, of repeating trouble with the skull within uh, Mexican arc is very striking. And I mean, for me, of course, I think of Memento Mori's, I don't know if you mentioned that during your presentation, I don't think you did, but it's 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 very interesting to see this. Uh, what you were talking about, a, a um, the fragility of life through the, the, uh, the sense of the, um, the skull. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, the memento mori, <clears throat> I mentioned it, but in the in Spanish, which is they're known as calaveritas. So it's uh, around the day of the dead. You you um, um the, there's poems that people share that that will usually remember someone that has passed. In some way, it, it's a little different to Memento Mori uh, in the sense where it's um, this is um, it's about embedding it into into the everyday, right? So that it's something that is seen, so that you remember every moment. And you, we can see, I know from conversations that we've had before, where you know it's about in tattoos as well. You know, the, the, there's a, the constant reminder that this is there for you. And and so I I, I and I see skeletons as as the it's one of the ways that uh, we we have access to that similar to how um to how comics have got this kind of visual language that a lot of people can access quite quickly i think skeletons are like one of those symbols that you can see across all of the world and and represent so yeah 
Absolutely. And uh, jumping on that, I can see a question from Esther. Uh, yeah, asking him about asking if you want to share a bit more about um, the figure of uh, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Tezcatlipoca. You got it uh, right every <laughs> single time. This is yeah. I so Tezcatlipoca is uh, I say is is one of the uh, is the shadow counterpart of Quetzalcoatl. So because I'm wearing the T-shirt actually, the feathered serpent, um, and. You can kind of understand them as the as the shadow version, uh, uh, but also the uh, of the light. Um, but that that would be putting a Western construct onto that idea. Um, Tezcatlipoca and and Aztec religion in general is very. Um, it's um, it has tentacles and tendrils that move across, and so you can say that it's one thing, and then it turns into something else. So one of the the myths is that uh, he. Uh, created the world with his brother Quetzalcoatl, and Tezcatlipoca was responsible for some of the sons that we that we encountered. And the Aztecs lived to, um, to the fifth son, and and there, there were different uh, moments and different things that went on as these sons were created. But then uh, Tezcatlipoca, then or there is also the four Tezcatlipocas. And the four Tezcatlipocas is it can map, be mapped to the body, and you have the black, the white, the red, and the black, white, red, and blue, Tezcatlipoca. And I think that is, um, I, and, and the way in which I, I then understand this as a strategy is um, is perhaps, uh, I mean, I, I, mean I, I think I'd like to know if, if there's something else that, um, that Esther would like to know about Tezcatlipoca specifically, but that's, because uh, I could kind of go on and on. <laughs> Oh, no, I mean, that was lovely. I just interested a little bit more in, you know, and what it is and and sort of what the connected um, legends and sort of concepts are. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could listen to that all night, but obviously <laughs> that's fine if you want to stop there. I think there's another question. So yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. Thank well. you. See. Thank you, Esther. I mean, there's, yeah, there is things around how Tezcatlipoca would be encountered uh, as and, and you would steal his heart. And so uh, when you were walking on the dark road, you would encounter him. So there's, uh, there's, there is something there, there's the narrative and, you know, the, the, the fascinates me there. But I will, I will let Emma um, ask the question. Absolutely. Shall I come in? Shall I ask my question? Absolutely, absolutely, please. Yeah, I, I've tried to write it in the chat where it sounds a bit long winded, but I was I was trying yeah. to work out. So thank you, Matea. That was really fascinating to hear about um, haunting and, and sounds. And I was yeah. I was just trying to, to work out, you know, what you were kind of arguing about, perhaps the differences between the acoustic and the, the visual. So I wondered whether at one point you seemed to be saying something that there was maybe a seamless connection between the ordinary and the supernatural in the acoustic if i've understood that right yeah and i was i was just wondering whether um there's something about in you know the, the case studies that you've been looking at and your own research whether you think there's something about sound or like particularly echoes which you mentioned a few times which becomes almost paranormal in certain situations or in certain spaces or places because Another research student who's not here tonight, I don't think, Ali, who's worked on on ghost walks, like one of the things that she found when she was studying ghost walks was that if you're in a, a walk in a kind of scary place and um, you're being told these stories, then the sounds that you hear around you, even if they're like something like ducks or, you know, something that isn't scary, they become scary because you associate them with the story that you're being told. Yeah. So I wondered whether you had come across anything like that in your your own research. Um, that's a great, a great question, actually. Uh, yes, of course, like um, the power of suggestion and uh, expectation is, is fundamental, of course, and it's something that is also like acknowledged as a fundamental part of the paranormal itself by also like the practitioners, the believers. So it's not something that um, debunks the, the paranormal, it's actually one fundamental part of it. And about uh, the sound, uh, you said like, uh, even if there were uh, the, the, uh, the sounds of the ducks, they seemed, and this is what I um, 
what I meant when I talked about this kind of a continuum from the ordinary to the supernatural. So what I find many times in many accounts of like alleged paranormal experiences is that it's not that much sound itself that is uh, that triggers the supernatural, the, the paranormal. So it's not like the weirdness, the strangeness of the in, um, incomprehensibility of the sound, but rather it the in the connection it the sound and sound the sound event and and listening establishes the context with space. Mm -hmm. So some, most of the times are ordinary sounds, but they become extraordinary because they happen somewhere where they shouldn't be or in a context where they shouldn't be that way and acoustics in terms of really um, acoustic science so again like resonances reverberation how space transform the sound and transform a, a ordinary sound in something which is like different and when I talk about this kind of a seamless transition, I um, I, should have, I should explain myself better probably. I mean, it can be improved, of course. It's still like a work in progress. But I mean that it's not there's not this kind of um, apparitional moment of the, you know, so like the ghost. So sound is a present. No, sorry, uh, the, the the paranormal is a present. It's it's present and it's there. It's something but sounds gets more to the potential of something else uh, happening or something else in the place and um, I, I had another another uh, another slide but then I cut it off because I was already too long it was about how I identify with this kind of process identify what Mark Fisher defines the eerie so mm -hmm. as, as like opposed not really opposed but like, um, to the weird so the weird is this wrong presence this um impossibility which is which is there nonetheless uh, and the eerie is this more like transitory like um liminal question of agency question is is there actually something else or not and it's kind of like a uh, crossroads whether the eerie dissipates and disappears both when there's a natural explanation or supernatural one Mm. Makes sense, and, and I think that sound and the acoustics and the ecologies of sound, in particular, are uh, those elements that really bring forward this process uh, till a point of like saturation or rupture, probably mm. the apparition of the ghost or, or the of the UFO or whatever. And in that case, then also there is another kind of sonic dimension, which is the weird sound, the scream, and the, the monster sound. Mm. Thank you. That that's really helpful. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. The one for Jose, I think. Oh, you're on mute, Fred. Sorry, that had to happen. Thank you for a wonderful question and wonderful answer. Uh, we have a fair number of questions now. Come in, uh, Teresa. If you want to come first and ask a question, we you prefer me to read it. Um, so. I'm here. <laughs> In the there you go. Um, what struck me about both presentations actually was this idea that you both mentioned about material agency, whether that be a connection to the, the, the natural phenomena. So whether that's the earthquakes and the volcanoes and the, the visual on that or the, the you know the pre the presence of a past echo, um, but as sound and that resonance. So I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about those ideas of the material agency and sort of how that works within your research and whether you think material eco-critics such as Karen Barrett, for example, or Serenella Iovino, who've talked about a little bit about this material agency in natural phenomena, could have any bearing on the interpretations that you have. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the more than human, I think, engaged with everything that I was looking at and how how I was engaging with these projects. And and, and I think that it's, I guess, I'm thinking, yeah, literally, <laughs> there's uh, our Bible here. Um, I'm yet to read it fully. So, like, I feel like I should let Matteo actually fully talk about it. No, 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 no me too. Um, it, 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 it's fundamental, the concept of, the barrage concept of interaction, for example, is agential realism and the idea that 
uh, agency is not something I I I, I'm, I use a lot of like actor and actor theory in my research, and the idea that agency is not something preconstituted and like uh, already existing, but something that emerges from interaction. And this is my idea of materiality. I'm not in a, in a completely uh, new materialist uh, perspective because I acknowledge also the power of the, the, the role of discourse uh, and narrative, and I'd like to uh, to study also the the resonances between the two, these two poles and they influence each other. But this, from a material point of view, is like, oh, I think many times it starts from a very like, yeah, physical dimension, an interactive dimension that I recognize as like happening through the medium of sound and vibration. And this, as I saw told before, like this uh, ordinary sound, ordinary sound happenings and events uh, become something else because of specific interactions, material interaction that then got to, from the affective, they then get qualified into maybe a specific instance of the supernatural discourse. So like, oh, it's a ghost or it's a, it's a alien, it's a monster or something. I'm oversimplifying now, of course, but I think there's something in this, this kind of um, process. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, from from, I mean, even just from an experiential uh, level, I, I I think being able to tune into these uh, and uh, these objects and to be able to think about the stories that they tell that they can tell is a really like important thing that mm -hmm. we need to kind of be exploring and and you know even if it's the perspective of the mushroom and to be thinking how the mushroom travels and and or to be thinking about where the mirror and how the mirror moves across you know or the nutmeg or anything from these perspectives everything can then open up and i think everything anything that moves us away from just the purely human the purely subjective i think is something that um well from the from from the modernizing kind of totalitarianism that we've been experiencing is, is an important thing to explore especially when it comes to kind of kind of the climate. I would say maybe have a look at um, Surinella Ayavino because she talks a lot about the um, the stories that um, statues and how that interacts sort of the rock and and the material that's used for things mm. you know for think for creating say statues or things that are in an urban human man-made but actually become these natural stories natural phenomena so you might find that quite interesting thank you Teresa could but, you thank you could you post that in the chat just so I could uh yeah get, uh, name yeah Super. yeah we'll do wonderful writer uh, and you know storied matter for example is also a very interesting concept in yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah yeah absolutely thank you uh, our next question, uh, I think, I think uh, Esther, I think you had another question. If you want to uh, come in uh, and ask your question directly, we would prefer to read it. Um, yeah, I, I can ask it. Um, yeah, so um, it's a question about um, resonance again, and um, just interested about you were talking about people accessing the sort of frequency um, for. Um, uh, meeting with sort of paranormal events in conscious situations like seances and doing that, you know, um, <laughs> with intent. But what about what are the ideas surrounding how someone might just accidentally have a paranormal experience and what what kind of frequencies are they tuning into or how are they doing that? Um, yes, yes. Um, good question. There's certainly um, a dimension of like the, 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 the so-called like spontaneous experiences, just, just just like stumbling upon the paranormal somehow. But um, what emerges in what I've read, uh, at least uh, in like uh, the accounts of this kind of hypothesis, is that it's never really spontaneous. So probably you, the experiencer, they have um how can i say um oh english um sorry <laughs> they um, they have fulfilled certain conditions without knowing it's a bit like the the idea of the um, 
classical trope of horror movie the person like without wanting they like the the, the uh, and evoke uh, a demon or something because they do something wrong so, so they might be in like a heightened state of sorry they might be in some sort of heightened state or traumatized state or yes and the situation the place or the context has its own uh, like eerie resonance frequency if you happen to attune to that one there the supernatural or paranormal happens otherwise not so um i'm still working on this but uh, yes it's something yeah. I, i'm and and it's interesting because um If you go uh, this, uh, this, in this, there's also the role of uh, suggestion of expectation, of course. If you go in, uh, like in, into like an abandoned house, you might not experience anything, or you might, if you go in a certain place, a certain moment, you do something. In a lot of accounts, there's this idea of a repetition, which is, brings back again this idea of frequency of like a time articulation. Uh, but there's always kind of like fulfilling certain conditions that have to be met. And in that case, even if it's like, uh, like yeah. uh, uh, unconsciously, then the supernatural or the paranormal. Like, could it be a place that has its own resonance that you yeah. Yeah. absolutely? Because it's a resonance, it's not something uh, it's not completely external, it's not something completely internal. So there has to be an attunement between the internal and, and the external, the subjective and the objective. Um, yeah, this is at least something that um, is very common to find in the, in the in the theories in the in the mm. hypothesis. Yeah, I don't know if I answered the question, but yeah. Yeah, no, thank you very much. That's mm. good. Thank you. And I was new to you again. Uh, thanks for your needs. Uh, Oli, I think you had a couple of questions you wanted to ask before our speakers. Do you want to come? On to ask, or we prefer to read. Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah, so I had one for Jose and one for Matteo. Um, so Jose, you're, you're, I'm just going to read out what's on the question because I'm just going to waffle if I don't just read it out. Uh, your projects past and present draw attention to the overlap between uh, like objectivity and subjectivity, and I mean that in terms of the content of what you are researching was explicitly that's what you were looking at, but also your creative responses seem to highlight that itself it seems to be something that you yourself were interested in um has the process of undertaking that kind of research you know walking that fine line changed your view of other uh, you know quote unquote traditional research methods or a supposedly more you know objective big quotation marks sources exactly in, in quotation marks i mean so the work that I was that this was part of my master's thesis and it was it all emerged from a context of people rejecting um, the the ideas of positivism and of objective reality and and the and the the structures around how photography for example has been used uh, by anthropologists as a form of colonizing people and so this um, way of, of using images is you know has uh, you know the, the whole idea of anthropometry uh, uh, where you know the anthropometric kind of it would almost be these these um uh it would look like they're well are mugshots of people and to understand the shape and how people worked uh, uh, and how their bodies worked and you know building up a racial um taxonomy of of people and what i you know the the work that we were doing, well, the work that I wanted to do was an indirect response to that as a way of exploring the imaginative elements of what's there uh, that can quite usually be lost, especially within ethnographies. And and so the idea that of, of visualizing something that is there, that I encountered, that I saw, but and that I, well, no, that I didn't see, but that I experienced was really important. And and so the creative response of using comics was specifically a way in which that I could materialize it. 
and the way in which I could actually look and I could feel uh, and and see the stories within a in a, in in the actual comic because it was a physical comic at one point you know is it was something that I made that could be thrown away uh, and that it was you know meant to be flimsy it was meant to be lost and I was trying to kind of work out the you know the connections between oral storytelling and then what happens when uh, you use alphabets and recording devices to then try and capture that thing and so what I my my methodology as it as it were is is then a way in which, in which I want to try and capture all the different ways in which oral storytelling has uh, will overlap and interchange and and exchange and 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 deform and hopefully it, it, it's it's um, somewhat successful in that because it, it, it then by definition also means that it's quite confusing <laughs> but uh, I guess that's uh you know, thematically uh, apt, isn't it? When you're talking about this particular mythical figure, it's all about confusing those kinds of rigid distinctions. It's it's fascinating because it, it seems to, what is it? It's performing, performing the topic of your own research. It seems like a, something that's at least the sort of traditional responses to, to I mean, Gothic work, at least what, a lot of what I work with, um, seems to overlook. Um, very rarely is the form and the content aligned in, in the way that yours uh, seems to be working its way towards it. It sounds fascinating, definitely. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fred, do you want me to go on to Matteo's one or is there someone else? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Matteo, um, your concept of resonance um, and it particularly like how it, it, you know, realization and its materialization, it speaks to contemporary research on uh, social media which I'm fascinated with and the the idea of you know echo chambers and how opinions resonate or uh, create a discord um you know we could have been hang having this conversation on discord if we were using a not a university platform obviously um so it's it's fascinating how uh that idea of resonance has really shaped sort of internet culture I guess uh have you looked at all into texts where the internet uh, you know, either fiction or real life, like nonfiction, where the internet is connected to fear and hauntings and horror, um, whether through, you know, I'm thinking of that that spree of sort of horror films that were all connected to like online chats. I can't remember what the names were now, but or, you know, through like trolling and things like that, those kinds of very real life kinds of violence. Uh, I agree to 100%, absolutely, and yes, uh, yeah, in my presentation I talked m mostly about like, the first and the first two case studies because it's those I've written, and <laughs> last one, the more recent one, I'm yeah, still working on, I'm still in the, analysis, in, the, in, the, in the middle of the analysis of it, and that chapter, that section will be exactly about this, and about what is the role of this like cultural circulation inside and outside the that, that online and offline, I would say, and how this is another kind of resonance that um, produces, amplifies, transforms the modern discourse on the paranormal. Absolutely. Uh, these last years, is, um, this is uh, huge. And uh, yeah, you're talking about the phenomenon of like the creepypasta is now this kind of like, yes, yeah. fictional, like, like uh, viral fictional like memes. Not memes in terms of meme, mean in terms of like a yeah, Dawkins um, definition of meme, and um, that then they get uh, like reenacted in in, in 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 like in the in the physical world, and then they got fed back into the online, and this like uh, this feedback loop that like um, a positive feedback loop in terms of the constant amplification and the creation of new lore, new uh, paranormal lore and new stories and new experiences also. Yeah, absolutely. And um, um, for example, I was thinking about something that I, don't know, I think I already forgot. Well, I mean, like Slender Man itself seems like Slenderman. entirely lent it to it, yeah. Something I wanted to to write about, I will, I will write about this at some point, is this very niche, but um, they were pretty viral, like uh, eight years ago, the, the so-called like paranormal games. So basically it's like this kind of online viral uh, texts of like rule-based uh, um, 
things like um, or, or games or like um, a sequence of things to do to scare yourself or to have a, a, a paranormal experience. So one of the most famous was called the elevator game and it says that go to an uh, in a building where there's an elevator with at least 15 um, um, stories and go to the elevator, press the, the, the third the third floor and then wait, go outside, go inside, press the second floor, go outside. This kind of like process and then you get at the end of the process, you get to another world, to get to, to the other world. And uh, you have millions of YouTube videos of people trying it. Some of them are just like people with their phones, some of them are like fake, so things happen. But this thing like uh, fueled uh, like actual non-fictional lore and, and urban legends about things happening that some at some point got even connected with crime cases. <laughs> and, uh, like eight, nine years ago, there was this case of this uh, young woman disappearing in Los Angeles, and uh, the only thing that remained was the uh, footage from the elevator, and they said, oh, she was performing that ritual, that thing. So, and that got fed back into the, the fiction. Movies have been do done out of this, and then this kind of a feedback. Yeah, yeah definitely. It's, uh, it's a huge uh, area. It's a very rich area, and... Uh, um, Yes. Oh, it sounds it sounds brilliant. Yeah, I look forward to hearing about it. Mm. Uh, thank you, both yeah, of you. There's one, one example, so there's many, many. From this one to the election of Trump and me magic <laughs> yeah. and like outright uh, magic and so on. Like it's wild. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Brilliant. Thank you, both of you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank sounds you. like it. Uh, so we got another five minutes. So just if you can see, Esther has two small questions as well. Uh, but one, which is great, is there a way for you to uh, do you showcase your work anywhere, um, Jose? Can we read this comic? Uh, yes. Do you have a website for that? So. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll type it into chat. Absolutely. Because there's then, all and then, work as well that you can see. All right. Thank you, Esther. And indeed, Matteo, do you, um, <clears throat> do you, will you try to create sounds of paranormal res resonance? Hopefully. Because you're also a musician. <laughs> um, more than create the sounds of paranormal, paranormal resonances, maybe, um, maybe inspired by the, the, the kind of like pract online practices I was mentioning like minutes ago. There could be ways or like um, writing kind of games uh, to like oh, oh, things to be performed in places mm -hmm. that make you notice the sounds in a certain way to get attuned to this paranormal imagination so like i don't know like oh go in a like a by in nighttime in a building and listen to the first sound and then like a thing that triggers the imagination playing with the sound and, and sound in space that could be interesting of course and i think I, I, it's something i'm actually planning to do and um um and yet it could be interesting to use this kind of like theoretical approach to a more practice based uh, part also like in, yeah in sound design or or for example for video games Absolutely. Of course. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to this. Yeah. I think we are we are running into the last few minutes of our talk. So I just want to uh, conclude by saying thank you to both our amazing presenters. Thank you for the rest to the rest of the team, Ali and Teresa today, uh, for managing uh, behind the scenes um, and, and presenting and presenting the presentation. The presentation. I uh, just want to remind everyone to uh, that on the one hand, the next session uh, will be on the 19th of May uh, on Eco Gothic um, with um, uh, Kate Maloney and I will be presenting on Eco Gothic on the 19th of May, same hours, 5.30 to 7 um, p.m. We also, so all those, all those, to all those thoughts are uh, being put online on the Gothic MMU, the Gothic Center MMU uh, YouTube channel. So you can go and rewatch them, those you haven't seen, or watch those again. Uh, we also have a partnership with, uh, with Manchester University Press, uh, where you can get 30% discount on books. You just have to put OTH880 
um, in a time of your purchase. Uh, we also have a, um, a JSON Gothic reading group um, that will, as we said earlier, will begin this year on the 1st of June. We'll be reading um, Carmen Maria uh, Car Carmen Maria Machado's um, book, uh, Her Body and Other Parties. And there you go, but thank you very much for joining, for having joined us today. Thank um, and thank you to all the presenters. Thank you, everybody, for the amazing questions yeah, and thank opportunity. You so thank you. And thank you guys for inviting us. So. Yeah, thank you to the, to the to the Gothic Center and to the PGR seminar group.